Thank you, uh, Michelle. And um, I don't know if it's typical for European speakers to indicate what year they were born, but I probably was able to been, be your babysitter, perhaps even too old to have been your babysitter. But uh, 1971, I think, is still kind of recent, but uh, I know you're well along in your career with a really prestigious uh, international financial player. And um, it's interesting, the, the acronym you're using there for the Netherlands, which is international for NL, is, is also the one for um, a province of Canada, which has become quite interesting recently in the context of CETA. That's Newfoundland and Labrador. So um, it's, uh, we got our own NL to, uh, to make the CETA uh, implementation process uh, rather interesting. But uh, it's a pleasure to be in, in op uh, speaking in, a, in, in, a, in, a, in a, an activity that has that collaboration of um, Canada and Netherlands. We, we are definitely competitors in the world pork markets, but we collaborate a lot um, in dealing with, uh, because we each deal with many, many, many countries, uh, in our case over 100 uh, export uh, destinations, and I think the Netherlands would be similar to that. And um, so we have a lot of common issues on, on trade policy. That, um, that we have uh, worked together quite a bit uh, over the years, along with the Danes and, and the U.S. But um, we are, uh, uh, I guess another area of similarity between the Canadian pork industry and the, and, the, and, the, and the Netherlands would be our dependence on exports. And this chart here just gives you the um, progression of our exports relative to our domestic disappearance. Um, we are now exporting well over two kilos for every kilo consumed at home, and that doesn't include the live animals that we export to uh, the United States, both uh, for, um, for processing and for, and for feeding. Um, unlike uh, the Netherlands, which has uh, a lot of uh, that export going into uh, other EU member states, for which there is probably quite a bit more certainty of access than we have in the event of a uh, foreign animal disease. But in any case, this just gives you a notion of of our dependence on exports. Um, also, our increased uh, diversification to other major markets. And you can see just in the last decade and a bit, um, and if you went back to the, say, 1990, uh, when, uh, when we uh, escaped uh, a permanent duty on pork going into the U.S., a countervailing duty, um, when we were, I think, about 85% dependent on the U.S. Um, by 2000, we had cut back about to about 50, and now it's under a third of our exports going to the United States. Uh, a large portion uh, going to Japan. Now, this chart really is under understates Japan in the sense of uh, the value of the exports to Japan being much higher on an average uh, kilo than is the case for other markets. But nevertheless, the tonnage is well over half now going to other, other markets, whether it's Russia, China, uh, Mexico, Australia, Colombia, uh, New Zealand, etc., uh, Philippines. And um, now this um, gives you some of our major markets. And, and I think what's interesting here is the, um, if, is this the pointer? Yeah, so if, if well, if you can just uh, kind of look at that, that line for, for Japan, which is, one of, one of the many aspects of the Japanese market that's really important for Canada is its stability. If, if we're able to deliver the product, the quality, and the, and the reliability that, uh, that they require, then um, really it is um, a, a very a secure market. But then you see these, these other, uh, these other uh, much more jagged trend lines, which um, um, in some respects, unfortunately, have gotten a little bit large uh, for our, our, our industry to handle sometimes. That's Russia's and, and the China's of the world where uh, exports can be going along very nicely and then uh, other factors come along like domestic supply and, well, geopolitical uh, developments such as is happening right now in, uh, in, in, in the area of Russia that um, those markets disappear overnight. And uh, so massively, uh, it, it just under, understates how important it is for us to have alternative markets, which is one of the reasons why we had so much uh, interest in, in, the, um, in, the, in CETA. Um, so again, on a value basis, just to illustrates how some markets take higher valued um, cuts and, and products, and Japan being, as you can see there, the highest. And then we've got other markets which, uh, which are much, much lower, um, less than, a, well, about a third of the Japanese value if you look at uh, Mexico and Philippines. 
Now, it's not to understate the importance of those markets to us, because if we can get more for, uh, a, 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 say, a stomach from a, from a pig than in one market versus uh, another, that still adds value to, to the animal. So they are all critical to us, but it's just it's a matter of using all these available opportunities to get the mes best value for our, 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 our uh, final product. And um, another illustration of how we have diversified away from the U.S. over the years. So at one time, 80 percent. That's 20 years ago, and now it's about a third. So here's the, uh, just an illustration of the various c products that come from a pig. And uh, I think most people are aware that there's, uh, well, I do remember when we started out with our trade lawyer in our first U.S. Countervail case, and he was just kind of want to know a little bit more about what uh, pigs are all about. And, uh, and he thought that pork chops came from pigs, but that's about as much as he knew. So it isn't necessarily uh, everybody's uh, knowledge of, 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 of just how many different things. And these, some of these uh, outlying products uh, uh, around, the, uh, around the edge here, uh, those, are, those are the items that are going to China's and Philippines and Mexico and even Korea, South Korea and um, bring far more value from these export markets than, than the domestic market provides and, um, and, and are absolutely crucial to, uh, to us getting, getting returns to our pigs that sustain, sustain the industry. So, Canada EU trade agreement, uh, the elements were, uh, the, the, the text was, uh, was officially announced last uh, September. And it's currently going through this legal scrub, so that's where they need to make sure that well, they look at all the legislative changes that will be required in both jurisdictions to, to implement it. And hopefully that's going to be ready to be brought forward, and I'm using uh, hopefully reliable sources here um, that, um, that will see it brought forward to the European Council by the end of the year, and then it has to go to uh, uh, the Parliament, EU Parliament, at the same time in Canada got to go through our legislatures, both national and, and provincial. But it has, uh, has opened up uh, an 80,000 uh, 80, ton carcass weight equivalent, and, and carcass weight really is bone-in weight equivalent by um, uh, the end of the five-year transition phase. And each, each phase uh, is duty-free, so each tranche, which will be uh, um, uh, staged, is, uh, is going to be uh, duty free. And uh, just to give you a sense of the, uh, how, what this represents to existing EU imports, EU rough imports 30 to 40,000 tons, depending on what year you're discussing. And so we are looking at an amount that is three times. Well, if, if it was fully imported, would be represent a kind of a, 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 a trebling like of their existing imports. Um, but as, as people know about uh, the EU, it's not just tariffs and so on. It, there are other factors that have caused that market to be one that many people uh, looked at as impossible to penetrate. Um, a lot of that was in the area of quota administration. And we are uh, looking within CETA, and we, at, in, in, before, I guess, well, right up to the very late stages, we assumed that we were going to have a first come, first serve. Um, quota allocation system, which is what exists under the other EU free, tra free trade agreements. And that was, that was changed, um, partly out of pressure from some of the member states. But we do have a, a licensing system which um, actually could, could be more uh, favorable to those who are looking at continuous year-round shipments. There's a great deal more um, uh, I guess uh, compatibility in terms of the licensing issuing uh, licenses issued, the how long they can last, how much they can be carried forward through the year, uh, the security deposits are much more reasonable, and there's a much greater opportunity for new importers rather than just historic importers. So if we have Canadian pork processors and traders working with them to link up with European pork processors, for example, Italian. Um, uh, Parma ham manufacturers taking product from, from, from Canada, which they would process. These manufacturers can much more easily become themselves the importers than, than under, under the, under the uh, uh, regular EU import rules. And then, of course, we do have immediate tariff-free access for processed, uh, called Chapter 16, uh, meat products. Uh, admittedly, Europe is a far more developed uh, meat processing uh, industry than, than our own. There is a reasonable case for, uh, for seeing the deal implemented in 2016, 
but very much will depend on how things go between uh, the Commission and, and the Parliament. So um, we do have this staging, and that uh, just shows you how there's been kind of an, there's an equal, so it's actually in six, six stages, year zero being, or point zero being the first, and then five-year implementation. Now, the EU is a major pork exporter itself, as you can see here, so it's not far behind the United States, which itself was a huge net importer 20 years ago, but now the world's largest pork exporter. So within the European Union, we have over half a, over half a billion uh, uh, population, and their average pork consumption is, is just a little bit less than double what Canada's is, and um, which amounts to 20 million tons. So they, with their existing 40,000 tons of imports, or if you look at... Uh, at, at Canadian exports being fully filled, um, you're looking at half of 1% of, of uh, European market being provided by, by, uh, by imports. And um, this would compare with Canada's 25%. So one in every four kilos of pork consumed in Canada on a net basis is imported. And it's just part of that North American market. We're increasingly importing from Europe again. But um, it is, um, so I would suggest that this is going to be a very small amount in terms of any market impact in the U.S., but also a very small amount in terms of being uh, able to penetrate an enormous market. <clears throat> now, it's definitely not a, um, a single market, European uh, Union, and now and more and more as we've, as we've seen additions in countries like uh, Croatia and, 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 and the, uh, some of the Nordic countries, but we've... Um, We've, we've had a bit of work done in terms of um, intelligence on, on that industry and on that, that market. And just looking at three of the big countries, Italy, France, and Germany, just within there, you're looking at one of those, Italy being essentially a, an importer of, or user of hindquarters, this enormous processed ham market. Uh, Germany uses more pork and sausages than we, than we uh, consume pork in total, We're probably well over double that. And, and, which is primarily four quarters. That's the shoulders going into that. So those are two really interesting markets for, for Canadian pork, not Germany so much, but as the shoulders and, 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 and hams. Um, and then in France, you've got a mixture of those. Um, Germany's very highly processed uh, uh, for their different, uh, uh, well, sausages, et cetera. Um, and um, in terms of the market players, it's a very uh, highly fragmented uh, market uh, in, in Italy and France. Many, many smaller companies. Germany have some very large meat companies, uh, and some of them have, have taken uh, uh, ownership of part of parts of, of, of Dutch uh, companies as well. So, um, <clears throat> and then there's many other uh, considerations: seasonality of demand. Um, we are looking for opportunities to sell chilled pork more and more from Canada. That's, we first started to export chilled to Japan and then uh, other, several other markets. Um, but um, this is not something that's widely, uh, widely uh, knowledge, or knowledge of in, in Europe because um, they, they have really depended on their own local demand, local supply of, um, of fresh or uh, frozen. So. Um, Chilled product is something that Canada will have to look at staging in in terms of uh, uh, introducing to the European market. So some of the work we've had uh, from, uh, from this, um, from Jira, and uh, some of you may not be aware of this company, but uh, they've done uh, some work for us to just kind of identify some of the, some of the key criteria that will be determining our, uh, our success um, in, uh, or the opportunities and, and challenges that we've got going into that market. And uh, so this is looking at the criteria of buyers for the choice of product and certainly uh, conformity of EU rules, which, are, which we know are considerable. And some of these are regulated. Some of them are just uh, were, are, are things that retailers or distributors or processors will be requiring to buy our product. And, but this is not new for us. We're having to do it in many other markets now. We're having to not use certain feed ingredients, et cetera, for... Uh, for, for several of our markets, but it does require specialized uh, uh, adaptive, and I think Canada has a long-standing record for being uh, able to deal with different specs and standards and, and, and adapt to them. Of course, price. I don't think there's any market where price isn't a key ingredient. Um, and then there's a host of others. You can see the animal feed without GMOs is, is a factor, but it's certainly not, uh, not the top one. Um, breed is, seems to be uh, much less important than others. Now, that's product. Um, then we get into suppliers. 
and regulatory, regul regularity and, and reliability are, are the two largest. And you can see it does vary between markets, but um, certainly extremely important in, in all three. And um, ability to supply large volumes is important to some, but it's not certainly the, the largest. But uh, the lowest price you can see is, is, um, is, is, not, is, not, the, uh, is not the only, um, even the number one criteria for in terms of choosing the supplier. Uh, it's, it's very important for them to, in terms of choosing the product, but um, uh, there are other very important considerations. So we're going to need to understand that we have virtually zero awareness of pork in, in amongst the European meat industry. It'll be like, I don't know, Argentinians trying to come in and say we are major producers of watches or something. We're just not known for this product. There's a few that would be, have, have come across, traders would be aware of it, but in terms of the meat buyers, uh, whether they're proce further processors or consumers, they do not have much of an, a perception of, of our product. And on top of that is this issue of, of lack of awareness of, of chilled pork. And um, since they've been so used to having either fresh or, or, or frozen nearby, and, and, and there is, from the work that's been, this bit of work done so far, there's kind of a, a presumption that uh, most of our supply will be in the frozen area. So, um, so we do have a challenge there to, to, to introduce the chilled concept. Image is basically good, nothing you know, super outstanding that would you know, provoke people to change their buying behavior overnight. Um, so we're going to need to kind of create uh, um, some awareness of us as a potential supplier, uh, the strengths of us as a, as a, as a, as a reliable uh, supplier and introduce people to this uh, image of chilled and uh, frankly, we'll have to get started with uh, you know, attractive prices to uh, to get on to get on with things. So I'm just going to just go and I probably uh, how am I doing for time, David? Okay. Well, yeah. Okay. No, I just got a few slides here, and I, I think maybe I'll just kind of uh, a little more detail than I appreciated when I when I uh, put them down. But um, I think some of the some of the things that CETA gives us is. Um, in terms of kind of breaking into that, some of those European supply chains, um, technical issues are always crucial. Whether and again, some of them are regulated, some of them are just buyer requirements. But uh, in the area of regulatory requirements, um, some of which, uh, well, I guess probably all of uh, which fall somewhere in this category of sanitary, phytosanitary issues, uh, we do have some resolution mechanisms for dealing with these within CETA. Um, absolutely essential. Uh, I say at least we hope. Uh, there may be some things that we didn't know for sure. Uh, we knew some, some areas of, of European differences in European inspection systems that we had from ours, and we tried to address those in, the, in, in, in correspondence, or our negotiators did, but there probably are some others that we didn't appreciate in advance, and we've got to become aware of those before we... Uh, and I should add, though, we did start to export pork, so we're not totally new. Um, we were, uh, I guess, before we saw a significant decline in the euro um, and then a significant increase in European pork supply relative to market needs, uh, uh, given the Russia situation. There was, there was uh, a period there for, I don't know, two or three years where we did see uh, uh, um, some movement of Canadian pork into, into Europe, modest amounts, but we did have, at that point, three or four plants moderate-sized plants uh, approved for, for export. So it, it can be done, and, um, but it was done at a, a lower scale than we're looking at now. And, um, but it, it, um, it, it, you know, everything isn't going to be entirely new for, for everyone. There's been some changes in recent years, but um, I think what the CETA does provide is a bit of a, a, bit of a framework, I guess. Um, I, I think you know, if you look at all of Canada's past free trade agreements, Often they start with markets that, um, certainly not the case with the U.S., but in the case with uh, bringing China into the WTO or establishing an FTA with Colombia, other examples where we didn't have very much familiarity with those markets. We didn't have much in the way of relationships between suppliers and buyers yet. And um, frankly, I mean, that, that industry, the meat industry, kind of deals with what we have to sell today and where we can sell it today, maybe tomorrow, but not a year or two from now. So what it does is provides, provokes some interest uh, in this new market. And um, once you get this, 
I guess, this uh, dialogue going on uh, between buyers and sellers, you, you do start to see opportunities for, for business relationships to, to evolve, you know, if, if, of course, the price and the quality, et cetera, is, is there for it. And um, so um, I think just to wrap up on this slide, we, we, we would be looking at, at just having a, a better a, a, and a more rapid way of dealing with, uh, with, with uh, access issues and so on as they come along. Um, I think this area of advocacy not means, doesn't mean government lobbying. It, it, it means, um, I guess, putting the best interests forward of, of, of our industries within our business relationships. And um, it, it also kind of involves maybe, uh, I mean, certainly there will be cases where there's regulatory issues. And we would be uh, looking at, as we develop uh, knowledgeable and, 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 and uh, um, you know, kind of, well, creating joint interest between industries in Canada and, 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 the, and, in the, and in Europe to have certain issues addressed in our respective jurisdictions. It's, 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 uh, if you get the additional weight of the domestic suppliers, if we're always going in by ourselves to talk to a European uh, Commission official, uh, it's, it's much harder for us to get anywhere with that issue than if there is some collaboration or support from the, from the domestic industry as well. Um, so we see um, uh, a great deal of, what, like once we've found a way, I guess, to get into some of these supply chains, we would see uh, opportunities to, to uh, I guess, buttress the Canadian or develop uh, awareness of the Canadian uh, industry attributes, positive attributes. And um, I think uh, also uh, create interest in, in European uh, companies in, uh, in, in looking at Canada as a, as a, as a supplier, uh, developing contractual relationships. And um, also um, we, we um, can, can have uh, alliances sometimes which, uh, which, which can deal with, uh, with some of the third country markets uh, issues uh, that exist. I've already mentioned that we've worked with some of our Dutch and Danish colleagues on issues of access into um, some countries, South Africa, Russia, and so on. But uh, I think we could see uh, some expansion of, of some of that activity. Um, and I could have put Agriculture Canada, AFC, in this title, but I, I'm really, in this title here, looking at the support in our posts, which are part of our International Trade Department, Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and Development, I guess it is. But, um, yeah, we have seen some significant... Uh, you know, budget cuts have been all over, but we have lost some really knowledgeable people, locally engaged people, in some of our posts abroad in Europe. Uh, and I'm thinking of London and Copenhagen right now as examples. But uh, um, that's unfortunate, given that we're just now going to be, I think, in a more serious way, looking at uh, needing to establish ourselves and, and, and having the help of those people that are on the ground and going to trade shows and and having delegations of uh, Canadians coming to do market uh, um, research and, and, and meet new customers. And, and uh, some of the posts are not as able as they were to do that uh, five, ten years ago by, by losing those, those people. So we're certainly hoping that that is being taken into account. We know that there is some additional um, resources that are going, going to go into advocacy of Canada's uh, export opportunities or export potential to the European markets. Um, but uh, that'll be really important to, I guess, have European buyers uh, become aware of, of Canada as a, uh, as a reliable supplier. So, um, so, yeah, I'll just wrap up then on, on that and, uh, and just, um, um, just indicate how, um, how pleased we are that we have a case of where we've got a, um, a head start uh, on, on a market. It's certainly not going to become our, you know, one of our top-tier markets. It's, it's just too big a competitor for us to do that, but it's going to be a really important uh, opportunity for us to, to diversify and to absorb some of the shocks that we are exposed to by uh, some of the newer markets that we uh, have become uh, need to kind of move our product to, uh, to obtain the best value uh, possible. So thank you very much.